Hi everyone, very excited to be here. Um, we're gonna be talking about something that we just started working, so be, be kind with me, be kind with the questions. And actually, um, I am us usually talking about genomics. I'm a genomics guy. I have switched a little now to some structures in, in chemistry. Um, I've been talking about graph collision networks and especially uh, natural products in, in a specific database, this NAPROC 13. So graphs are everywhere. Actually, if you were being sitting here, graphs have come on and on in, in the screen. And not only uh, in bioinformatics, they have many applications from social networks to any type of modeling and specifically um, to complex, to understand complex systems. So graphs are everywhere. Why? Because they are versatile data structures and they, are, they have very great expressive power. So basically anyone, any undergrad student in computer science we will tell you that a graph is just a, 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 a context, a, a set of, of vertices and axes and edges that can be direct or undirected. But when we talk about uh, molecular structures, basically we do the same, but we think, we think about molecular graphs. So basically now we have um, a molecule that on, on the left, on the right, basically we have a graph, which we will talk now about atoms and bonds instead of uh, edges and vertices. And then we'll have some properties about them, so some labels about the atoms and some of the, about the bonds. In general, there's uh, been myriads of, 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 um, of projects doing this, uh, determinations and probably predictions with uh, molecular graphs since the 80s. Actually, it's not, it's not new. And usually the task is about you know, learning different samples, basically different graphs, and then learning basically the structures of of some fragments of some fingerprints or some specific conditions that might be uh, related to some property, maybe toxicity, sol solubility, activity, bioavailability, bio bio et cetera. And this is all uh, known as a Q QSR or QSPR. Um, one of those representations, not, in everything, not everything is done on graphs. Actually, we have something called smiles, which is a chemical language in itself, and that actually represents in a, the, the molecule in a linear fashion. That will be interesting why it says a chemical language that will be interesting in a, in a moment. But basically you can represent any molecule from left to right, uh, writing uh, the, car the carbons from one to another. Uh, one then to another. And then you have specifically about the, how the bonds are connected, which, uh, which atoms, etc. So learning about molecular graphs, what, how can we do this? Uh, what thing, the first thing comes to mind, basically you can learn the image itself. It, this, this might be problematic because, uh, as you might know, the 3D, con if you're basically going from a 3D system to a 2D system, which might be, uh, might lose some details. So basically, when you have an image like this, the, you can do it with a CNN, a conventional neural network, but that they can, they can learn your specific of the image and not of, not of the generalization of the structure. Um, some other ways to do this is uh, our molecular graphs, is like so basically learning the, the graph itself and passing it through a, com, a graph convolutional network. And the third uh, way um, of many, not only the three, this three, uh, is basically transforming the graph, molecular graph, to a smiles, to a smile code, to a linear code, and then putting it to a, a recurring neural network. Of these three, I will first address how this is done with, uh, with the smiles. So basically, uh, you want to uh, understand this linear relationship. And one thing that can, came to mind and, and, and that is, that's happening in literature is the cross-pollination between fields. Obviously, conventional networks are everywhere, but now also the, the great challenges are about text and, uh, and probably also about the brain. Those, uh, the, those are the main things I think are like the hardest ones. So what they do in, with uh, recurrent neural networks is basically creating embeddings. The same that happens with word to back. So basically uh, in learning the linear relationships and then translating it to a, a, um, a complex function representation, but, well, but linear. And then uh, the grammar, uh, one of these examples is miles to back, which is uh, from a paper from Go and all. And which actually they never explicitly put the grammar. They actually learn the machine, learn the structural relationships between uh, a many to one uh, uh, relationship. 
basically, there's something like this. We have an input, which is, will be the smile sequence itself, and the output are uh, some chemical properties. Uh, I will go into detail very briefly, but basically, they do with a very simple neural network. So they have, uh, uh, they have an embedding it, so as a function, which actually goes through a convolution, and then two um, gate recurring units, uh, bidirectional, and then a softmax just, just to predict the, the property. And they actually get the, and they learn, they actually learn some, some of the patterns that actually are related to the property and they, they are highlighted on the, on, on the right. Also, this, um, this structure can be extended with attention models and it can be easily explained. Um, also, uh, <laughs> just for the computational scientists out there, so smiles actually can be, it's, they have regularity, they are regular language, they can be also analyzed as context free grammars but that later. Um, the other thing that can be done is actually learn itself, the graph itself. Uh, by doing that, you have to use something called graph convolution networks. So what is graph convolution networks? It's basically the, the grandchild of, of neural networks and convolutional neural networks and graphs. Uh, it's like a big, big complex family. So they keep um, some of the structures of uh, the neural network, but also they, they get from the CNNs, they get two of the main uh, properties, which is uh, the pool pooling and, um, and basically doing the convolution. So the convolution itself is basically putting a uh, um, function over a function, which in terms of uh, images, basically just creating a mask over uh, an image. But if, when you do it on a graph, it's basically putting, putting it in, um, just creating the neighborhood of, 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 of a, a node and then trying to see some property. And the pooling actually is just basically the sum of, of, of all of average or sum of all the neighbors. Then that is put onto a convolutional structure, which will be something like this. Uh, we'll have some convolutional um, layers, but also they will have um, like pooling layers. And at the end, just on like a normal um, neural network, you will have some fully connected uh, um, uh, layers. Uh, one thing also I have to say is that not only um, you cannot put the graph by itself, you have to put also an GHC matrix, which will be n, uh, A times N, N times N, when Ns are the number of atoms of the, of the graph. Um, there's also some variations that are, uh, that are the, um, having been explored, uh, well, basically with attention, and some of them will also will be looking at specific spaces. So basically in the reduction part of the, of the graph, what is a context of what's close and what's far, right? So if we think Euclidean, we have a clear understanding of that Euclidean space. But if we talk about non-Euclidean spaces, maybe we'll have to have a different manifold, a different representation. So then there's two um, networks that actually are doing this. The MoNet and the ChefNet, especially ChefNet, which actually use uh, Serichef uh, polynomials to understand this relationship. In terms of uh, molecular chemistry, actually there's few examples actually uh, that have been working for graph generation and, and property prediction, and uh, those are uh, mentioned there. But what about what's next? And what's next, it's um, natural products. And natural products for you may be familiar, for me was, this is the first time I'm, 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 I'm not the third time, the first time, the second time, the first time we did, I work with natural products is when I presented this poster with Kesia, Kesia Barros, which uh, my, now my, my, my lab as a, as a doctorate degree, uh, looking for a doctorate degree. And we're looking at specific molecules that have been, uh, in, you know, in, captured in Panama through bioprospection and then see where they went. So what, how have been entered in the biotechnological sector, so it's about maybe a, a, a review with a bioeconomy sense. So the main main thing that I want to talk about is that I've been approached uh, by a colleague, Jose Luis Lopez from Universidad Salamanca Pharmacy Department. And now they say, well, um, well Javier, I know you've been working with uh, some chemistry. Well, I'm like, no, but, but yes, I can do it. So he says, I have a database of over 20,000 compounds, at least 24, thousand compounds. They are um, in uh, carbon carbon uh, shifts, uh, NMR detected carbon shifts. So basically it's a database with a full-fledged database, lots of compounds. 
and especially for us, have a lot of compounds that have been uh, acquired through bioprospection in Panama. And specifically, maybe some of you guys know Mahavir Gupta, which is a, was uh, unfortunately died uh, through COVID in last year. But one of the main, main, main um, um, precursors of, of natural products in Panama, there's uh, one of the highest names and a lot of publications that, that he published uh, on that. And the database itself has um, lots, of his, lots of the compounds he, he, he found. So what was the, the, the main idea we'll be looking at? So now we have a database in our hands and we have a few methods. So basically we'll have uh, SMILES representations of these uh, NMR molecules, but also we'll have um, the graph itself because that, that can be translated. So if you have SMILE, you can have also a graph and you can have the image itself because the database have the three of them. Um, and we have done some initial, very initial, very, very initial uh, test with this, working with SMILES. Uh, I just, just while I was sitting there, I just received the, the complete database. So I'm very excited about that, looking at that now. Uh, we had a very, very brief run with um, like, on, like only like 100, 100 uh, SMILES codes. And we were able to get some, some great results um, in terms of on, like on, on the point eight uh, scale. Um, but now, we would like to see if we can address not only the smiles, but also the second problem with graphs, and specifically looking at uh, non-Euclidean uh, relationships, and, uh, and also look at the images itself. itself. The problem with images is that uh, it, it, they're very heterogeneous, and basically you put a machine to learn just specific things, and that, that will not be realizable, but we also are thinking of doing something of that. Three things that we want to look at, specifically focusing on molecules that are discovered through bioprospecting. And basically in Panama and probably the whole region, in the Mesoamerican region, it's a, a hotspot of uh, biodiversity. Uh, and um, second, we'll focus on biotechnological products. What can be used for, for, uh, tech, for an enterprise in Panama? And third, and uh, more interesting, it will be a more generic approach that will be um, looking at uh, how to predict spectroscopic properties. So basically looking at not only the representation, but also the crystal structure and information from the crystals themselves and see how can build a machine algorithm around that. Um, so I have no results, but I have a very good proposal probably next year we'll use the results. Um, I have to acknowledge uh, Nicolette, which is uh, my student, that is uh, taking this challenge. Uh, Grimaldo, which is uh, uh, just graduated from UH, a PhD in system biology, which is uh, part of the project, Jose Luis also. Um, I'm my faculty, Faculty of Engineering Systems Computacionales, Faculty of Tecnología, Iberogun Cluster, which is the infrastructure we will be using for, for this program uh, in, in the UTP. Uh, also like to thank Rio, 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 Rio. Uh, I'm also part of the SNAE, so Sistema Nacional de Investigación de Panama. And um, also, uh, Nicolette is a, a bursary, has a burst from Senasi. I have my contact there. I will be open for questions. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Javier, for this interesting approach, more in the uh, pharma, pharma and drug uh, approach and comparison. Uh, natural products. I think the, when you do the, this prediction of natural product, uh, properties, it's more by comparison with other molecules, not, not, not with comparison with the targets of, of no? Yeah. It's more like pharmaco comparison more than ma in, in, the, in the sense of, uh, let's say, the biological target of the given, uh, no? Okay. Yes, we will start with uh, well, sorry, you don't see it. We'll start with property predict prediction, but then we'll look at similarity, and then probably also want to attack uh, new new molecules. Basically, the idea of, of this idea of, of creating new molecules uh, nowadays, all the generative uh, learning representations, but also you do the generative learning, and then you do the representations, variational autoencoders and GANs, all of that can be useful for this uh, for this topic. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I just have a, a small question about the uh, uh, representation of your graphs. 
so uh, when we have a chemical compound, we have different kinds of uh, atoms in there. So in your examples, you had a nitrogen and carbon. So uh, when you are uh, modeling it to a graph and uh, you are going to uh, feed it to a GCN, uh, how would you handle the different types of node in your GCN and in the learning process, in the convolution process? Okay, so one of the things that I, I even seen, so you have the eigenstreet matrix, which n, by n times n, so number of atoms, but then you can add many dimensions. You can add more dimensions, and then you put labels on those dimensions, and then transform it into a tensor. So now you have a tensor representation of a multi-dimensional space in a matrix, and then you can actually... So you, so you can put infinite proper, okay, so more properties. You're labeling the nodes instead of uh, like yeah, having different yeah, kind yeah. of Yeah, you have okay. to label the nodes and then do the, the transformation and then learn the, learn okay. the pattern, yeah. Okay, good. I have one other question, if it's... Sure. Uh, so uh, you talked about the attention mechanism in the uh, graph. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, you talked about the attention mechanism and applying it to your uh, problem. I was wondering, uh, what's the scale of the components that you're working on? Because... Uh, when we are talking about attention mechanism, it's because uh, when we have a, a large, uh, large uh, uh, scale uh, in our uh, data, in any of the data points, for example, in uh, NLP, when we have a, a large text that the RNN can, cannot uh, handle, we will use the attention me mechanism. And I was wondering, how would you apply that attention me mechanism to the compounds? So it's, it's akin to what what is done in NL, NLP, and then you have because this, the structure that we have can be small, but also there can be like around thirty five carbons, so it's huge structures. So then you will have you will need some some memory and attention to focus and see and and understand what happens in the cycles, right? Because you can you can start and then you have a cycle and then you have to go back to the linear linear and then you have another loop maybe you have another loop and then you have uh, you need some attention to be able to understand what happens before those loops. Okay. Yeah. So and and basically all the attention mechanisms that you will see in LP you now are looking they are being ported to uh, chemical structures. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question there? Thank you. Yeah. Any other last question, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, there. Ah, thanks for your talk. Uh, yeah, so a quick question. Uh, I was wondering the size of your of your graphs and, and how you store them currently. If you had look into parquet files or maybe Cassandra or Neo4j software, maybe. Uh, so far we're looking at just text. Um, I, I will consider some uh, graph databases, but at the moment uh, we have uh, look before for just now basically do using the NLP frame, framework. So basically you do a text and you do tokenization and then you do the embedding and then basically you, you learn the graph. So no, at this point, at least no, we have no used uh, databases like graph database. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Great talk. Thank you again. Thank you.